station as a whole. And the stations that are airing this broadcast include the one to which you are listening, Boston Free Radio, the one to which you are watching and listening, Somerville Community Access Television, or some community uh, TV station that was nice enough to pick up this broadcast, and then I say thank you, as always. Or you are watching and listening to me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's page. Either way you could join me, I'm glad you could do- join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. So before I get into the three movies I'm going to review for this show, I'm going to get into my normal segment, What's Topping the Box Office? These are the top ten highest grossing films of this past weekend. Are they box office winners? I won't go that far, but of course I will tell you whether they are winners or eventual losers. Number one at the box office is actually also the number one highest grossing debut movie of the week, which I didn't actually expect. I thought Blade Runner 2049 was going to hold on to that number one spot, but that number one spot was taken away by Happy Death Day, which premiered on Friday the 13th, and what a great day for a uh, horror movie to premiere. Not just on Friday the 13th, but Friday, October 13th. So anyway, Happy Death Day earned $26 million at the box office on just a budget of $4.8 million. So in just one weekend, Happy Death Day made more than five times the cost to make, making it automatically a certified hit. In case you're curious, internationally it's grossed $31.2 million, which means in every other country besides the United States, Happy Death Day has made $5.2 million, but it doesn't matter. It's a certified hit already here in the States and around the world. And that is one of the three movies I'm going to be reviewing for the show. Blade Runner 2049 slid from number one last week to number two this week in its second week in release, having made $15.5 million this past weekend. Against a budget of $150 million, Blade Runner 2049 has so far made just $61 million at the U.S. box office, and around the world it has made $158.6 million. So Blade Runner 2049 is struggling in the United States, but around the world it is already a tentative hit. The Foreigner, starring Jackie Chan, which is actually not, regretfully, one of the three movies that I'm going to be reviewing for this show, but maybe for next show. But The Foreigner is number three at the box office, the number two highest grossing film of this past week, uh, the highest grossing debut film of this past week, that is. It grossed $13.1 million at the U.S. box office against a budget of $35 million. Uh, Actually, let me check that. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm right. uh, Against a budget of $35 million. So it's not a hit yet here in the States, but around the world, which shows you how much influence Jackie Chan has, it, the Foreigner has made $101.5 million, so it's a little ways from being even a tentative hit here in the States, but around the world it is already a certified hit. It is number four at the box office this week, sliding from number three last week, having grossed $6.1 million this past weekend. Against a budget of $35 million, just like The Foreigner, it has so far made, in the United States, $314.9 million, And around the world, it has made $630.5 million, which, needless to say, makes it a certified hit here in the States and around the world. I'm just going to preface it in future What's Topping the Box Office segments in the coming weeks as it's a certified hit. Here are the numbers. The Mountain Between Us is number five at the box office this weekend, sliding from number two last week. This weekend... The Mountain Between Us made $5.8 million against a budget of $35 million. The Mountain Between Us has so far made $20.6 million here in the States. And around the world, it has made $30.2 million, which means it is not a hit yet here in the States or around the world. But that may change in the next week or so. American Made was number six at the box office last week. This week, number six at the box office, having made $5.5 million against a budget of $50 million. That's five zero. American Made has so far made $40.2 million here in the States. And very similar to Jackie Chan, this shows Tom Cruise's clout around the world. American Made has made $112.1 million worldwide, which means it's actually not a hit yet here in the States, but around the world it is already a certified hit. Kingsman, The Golden Circle is another movie that's doing extremely well around the world. 
Here in the States, it's number seven at the box office, having grossed $5.4 million at the U.S. box office this weekend. Against a budget of $104 million, Kingsman the Golden Circle is made in its fourth week in release, or in its four weeks in release, $89.7 million at the U.S. box office, and $286.6 million worldwide, which means it's not yet a hit here in the States. It may be in the next couple of weeks, but around the world, it is already a certified hit. The Lego Ninjago movie is number eight at the box office this weekend, having grossed $4.3 million at the U.S. box office this past weekend. Against a budget of $70 million, that's $70 million, the Lego Ninjago movie has made so far $51.6 million here in the States, and 97 million around the world, which means that the Lego Ninjago movie is actually not a hit yet here in the States, but around the world it is already a tentative hit. We'll see if it, it doesn't look like it's going to become a even a tentative hit here in the States, but around the world it is probably going to be a certified hit in maybe about two weeks. We'll have to see. And the last two movies on the list, number 9 and number 10, I actually don't have the budget information for. So I can't say whether these movies are hits or not. But it doesn't look good for My Little Pony the movie. My Little Pony the movie was number 4 at the box office last week. This week it dropped really low to number 9. Although it's not out of the top 10 yet, obviously. But it made $4.1 million at the box office this past weekend in its second week of release. My Little Pony, the movie, has made a total of $15.6 million here in the States and $19.9 million worldwide. I can't say whether it's a hit or not, but it doesn't look good for this movie. However, Victoria and Abdul, in its four weeks in release, is looking slightly better, having made $3 million at the box office this past weekend. Against an undisclosed budget, Victoria and Abdul has made $11.2 million here in the States and $40 million worldwide. Again... I don't know whether or not that means it's a hit or not. The average time a resume spends on an HR manager's desk is seven seconds, and most of them are tossed aside. Now imagine if one of those resumes belonged to Yasmin, who was... Living in a shelter, juggling three jobs. I had to be resilient. That's something that you can't teach. We rely so much on a resume, yet it could never tell the full story of someone who... Had to be independent and take initiative. And that's how I handle every project I get. Discover new ways to develop great talent at gradsoflife.org. Brought to you by Grads of Life and the Ad Council. Welcome to Mr. Bear's Violet Hour Saloon, where the sky is even and gorgeous, the drinks won't cloud your head, and the cocktail nuts are poems. Join me, Mr. Bear, every Tuesday at 8 p.m., Boston Time on bostonfreeradio.com for music, poetry, fiction, interviews, and more. Making the lonely a little more bearable. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and the first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Happy Death Day. Now, this is a movie I've explained to my Facebook viewers that I didn't actually know it was an original movie, and by original, I, I think that's a little bit of a stretch. I'll explain why I don't think it's particularly original when I get to my review, but Happy Death Day sounds like a low-budget horror film from the 70s. This movie is a low-budget film. It's only $4.8 million, although to the movie maker's credit, it doesn't look like a low-budget film, but by Hollywood standards, it is pretty low-budget. But it sounds a lot like a lot of those low-budget films from the 70s that were a little bit more... Uh, eh, what's the word I'm looking for? A little bit more schlocky than, say, The Exorcist or... Uh, one of those kinds of movies. It's, it sounds like Silent Night, Deadly Night, but Happy Death Day is indeed an original film, or at least the the, the premise, it, it's not a remake, what I mean by that. It was written by St Scott Lobdell, who's actually had a vast array of movies for which he's written the screenplays. He's written the screenplay to X-Men Days of Future Past, which I actually regarded as one of the best films of 2014 back when I had my show. If you don't remember that, that's okay. My ratings were much lower than they are now back then. He also wrote the screenplay to a Tommy Lee Jones comedy, yes, a comedy called Man of the House, which I think did okay at the box office. And he's also written for the X-Men cartoon. So 
Happy Death Day is a movie about a college student who relives the day of her murder with both its unexceptional details and terrifying end until she discovers her killer's identity. So the movie to which Happy Death Day will inevitably be compared is Groundhog Day. In fact, it's so similar to Groundhog Day in that sense that in at the very end of the film, when the victim here, who is a woman by the name of Tree Geldman, yes, there's a woman in this movie named Tree. I, I don't know of any woman who would be named that, but regardless, that's the name of the character. But an acquaintance of hers actually points out the sim similarity between the circumstances of her repeated murder and the movie Groundhog Day. The movie tries to cover this up by having this character, Tree, who's played by Jessica Roth, not ever hear or of the movie Groundhog Day, let alone seen it, and is not familiar with Bill Murray's work. Yeah, right. That, that doesn't work at all. Yeah, this movie is a merciless ripoff of Groundhog Day, although it is a horror film, but it is so ridiculous in premise that there actually are some funny scenes in this film, but this movie is so bogged down with so many stereotypes and so many cliches that it just doesn't separate itself particularly well from Groundhog Day or Edge of Tomorrow or any of those other movies that have the protagonist repeat the same day over and over again and is cursed to repeat that day without very much of an explanation whatsoever. Now, Edge of Tomorrow, which came out two or three years ago, starring Tom Cruise, certainly had a lot of similarities to Groundhog Day, but it had a better story to it. And Happy Death Day is just full of cliches and stereotypes we've seen several times before. This girl who's the protagonist who's the one who keeps getting repeatedly murdered and is trying to solve her own murder is good in her role her, her name the the actress's name is jessica Ro roth r-o-t-h-e i'm going to pronounce it roth and she's been in several movies before including la la land from last year she played a character called alexis although i can't quite recall her in that movie but I, I don't think you could blame me there. Uh, she's also been in another TV series, which actually premiered last year called Mary and Jane. But again, I haven't seen that one either. She, I thought she was good, but she wasn't given a lot with her role. In fact, one of the things I liked about Jessica Roth in this role is that she wasn't stereotypical. I mean, she certainly had characteristics that made her unique. Unfortunately, a lot of the other characters didn't have those unique characteristics. There was a seemingly nice guy whose room she wa wakes up in, whose name is Carter, who's played by Israel Broussard. She also has a bitchy sorority sister named Lori, who's played by Rudy Modine, who is so carbon copied from Animal House, it's, it's a wonder that maybe in this universe the movie Animal House didn't exist either but again this movie invites a lot of similarities to movies that the film makes you wish didn't exist so this movie could come up with it so again what didn't make this movie particularly good or memorable to me is that if you are reliving your murder day over and over again which also happens to be your birthday I would think that there were ver there are various ways that you can go back and find out who the murderer is without being murdered yourself, you know? And this movie doesn't seem to think of any particular good ways to do that. Also, the murderer who murders this girl, Tree, over and over again, wears this creepy mask that happens to be the face of the college mascot. And I don't know if any... It's this... It's this infantile, creepy-looking baby with one tooth that has this sadistic smile that makes you doubt that any college would ever have a baby, let alone a creepy-looking baby, as a mascot. I, again, I, I just don't know. I, I also don't really know what the, what the name of the mascot is. Are they the babies? Did they ever expect to win a game or strike fear into the hearts of their opponents being called the babies? I don't know. 
again, it, you could have made a team mascot potentially scary, like maybe a wolf or a mountain lion. That's scary, but having a, a baby's mask that's already creepy in of itself just destroys the plausibility of this movie. And Happy Death Day might get a strikeout for how much I like Jessica Roth in this role, but it gets a flunk out because for every original aspect of Tree Geldman's character, the, the character Tree Geldman, there are so many cliches and so many things that make you wonder why this movie was even made to begin with. So Happy Death Day is a huge disappointment in a year full of huge disappointments for horror films. You're not wired to have a response to this sound. You're neutral to it. And you can hear it repeatedly without feeling anything. But when we introduce a new stimulus, save the food. We've achieved pulling a natural or inborn response from you. Save the food. Because 40% of all food in the US never gets eaten. Save the food. Cook it, store it, share it. Just don't waste it. For tips and recipes, visit savethefood.com. Brought to you by NRDC and the Ad Council. <laughs> Never Stop the Madness, Tuesdays at 9 p.m. BostonFreeRadio.com Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is an independent film called The Florida Project. It's directed by Sean Baker, who is a relatively young director who's also, he's written a number of films and also directed a number of shorts. This is the very first movie I've seen of his. Of, of the feature length films he's directed have been ones that have included Prince of Broadway and Tangerine, but again, I haven't seen those films. He's also, strangely enough, written for some TV projects, including the canceled Fox sitcom Greg the Bunny, which is kind of interesting. But The Florida Project is a movie that looks actually kind of like a documentary, and if it hadn't been for Willem Dafoe in a supporting role, I would have thought that this movie was a documentary. It's a movie that takes place in Orlando, Florida, and it's set over one summer. The film follows precocious six-year-old Mooney, who's played by newcomer Brooklyn Prince, in a, in a great debut performance, as she courts mischief and adventure with her ragtime, ragtag, excuse me, playmates and bonds with her rebellious but caring mother, all while living in the shadows of Disney World. So as I said, this movie takes place around the Orlando area, but not actually in Disney World itself. And that actually adds a bit of irony to the movie because here are these people living miserable and borderline squalid conditions outside the border of the happiest place on earth. Now, I've been to Orlando primarily to, to go to the theme parks, actually exclusively to go to the theme parks, and I, I remember being around the Orlando area. Of course, this was 20 years ago, and times have changed since then, but I actually was kind of surprised that when you get beyond the confines of Disney World, SeaWorld, uh, Universal Studios, that it's actually, it's not the greatest place to be. And that, that might actually seem kind of heartbreaking to people who might move to Orlando thinking it is the happiest place on Earth. But then again, the people who are in this movie live in motels the motels that are a lot more run down than than say the ones you'd find in or around the disney world area particularly th these motels have majestic names like there's the there's the motel that mooney lives in which i can't remember the exact name of it i think it's called the magic castle and it's made to look like a castle but when you actually go into the rooms they're a little bit more like a howard johnson or a, a marriott than 
than it would be more like the Ritz or the La Quinta Inn or any of those more upper scale hotels. There's also another hotel that's nearby where Mooney has playmates to whom she visits constantly, which is called the the Future Hotel. But when you actually visit the Future Hotel, there's nothing really futuristic about it other than the makeshift rocket props that are outside the hotel. And there's actually a great scene where there is a couple who just got married who are spending their honeymoon in Disney World, but then they arrive at this Magic Castle motel and they immediately want to turn around and go away. As a matter of fact, the bride who is speaking Portuguese because she's Brazilian is lamenting to her fluent husband that the, the place is terrible and that she, she thought she, he was bringing her to the Magic Kingdom. So, and judging from the more you get to know the hotel or the motel, you can't really blame this newly married couple for wanting to leave. And the, the hotel is populated by people who actually live there full time and pay the rent by the week, including Mooney and her, her single mother, Hallie, who's played by Bria Vinati, uh, B-I-N-A-I-T, I'm going to pronounce it Vinati, in a remarkable breakthrough performance here. Bria Vinati is an attractive woman. She looks uh, actually kind of like hey, uh, Hillary and Haley Duff. Or maybe even Kat Dennings from Two Broke Girls. That's who she kind of reminded me of. But I, I thought she did well playing someone who does care about her daughter, but also obviously cannot provide for the way that a, a girl of her age, probably about six, would need to be provided for. And in fact, you learn about some of the ways that Hallie makes money while bringing Mooney along with her. And... They usually involve buying perfumes wholesale and then soliciting wealthier vacation goers in the Orlando area who are staying at nicer hotels. But there is also another way that Hallie makes money, which is not made readily apparent until near the end of the film. But there are hints along the way as to how Hallie makes the money she does. But the movie focuses primarily on Mooney as well as her other friends, Jancy, who's played by another young girl named Valeria Coto, and also so, some other younger kids as well. And Willem Dafoe is the manager and the groundskeeper of this second-rate motel. And you certainly can see him as a guy who's not a father figure, but he certainly trying to do his job and also maintain as much peace as is possible given the area in which he lives. And I, I thought Willem Dafoe was an unlikely choice to play an underappreciated hotel manager, but he does a good job in this movie. And there is a lot to love about The Florida Project. Again, it's a movie that's R-rated. It's a movie that has a documentary feel. And it's not to everyone's tastes, but I liked this movie a lot better than last year's American Honey, which was shot in a very similar documentary style. But I did think The Florida Project had a lot better of a story, and it also had better pacing. And for that reason, The Florida Project gets my rating of a knockout. I think it's probably one of my favorite films of the year so far. Again, we're about 10 months into the year, and I can't exactly say whether or not this will be in my top 10 for the year's end, but it will definitely be in consideration. I thought Willem Dafoe turns in a great performance, and there are also great breakthrough performances by Brooklyn Prince and Bria Venati. They'll challenge your authority, because that's what kids do. But this car is your territory, and in here, your word is law. So when you say you won't move until everyone's buckled up, you won't budge an inch until you hear that click. Never give up until they buckle up. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. For more information, visit safercar.gov slash kidsbuckleup.
This is Alan Patterson. I want to invite you all to tune into my music radio show, Voices of Time, heard live each and every Wednesday from 3 to 5 p.m. Eastern Time on Boston Free Radio at bostonfreeradio.com. Voices of Time, while founded on the golden age of music from the 60s and 70s in all its permutations, also visits other eras and many genres. We feature rock and roll from its original era and beyond, rock in all its variations, including prog, psychedelia, garage and punk, Motown, old school R&B, soul, blues, jazz, gospel, folk, old school country, zydeco, all music New Orleans, rockabilly, bluegrass, world music, comedy, poetry, and spoken word, and much more. Please come and join me for an adventurous two-hour ride into the stratosphere of sound where the voices of time reverberate for all eternity. <laughs> Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is Professor Marston and the Wonder Women, which is actually based on a true story about the real-life professor who actually taught at Harvard Radcliffe College back when Harvard was exclusively a male college and Radcliffe was the, the female college. But anyway, Professor Marston started off his career at Harvard Radcliffe and had a very impressive resume of accomplishments before ultimately creating Wonder Woman. Well, this movie gets into the R-rated details and doesn't really flinch or hold back as to how Professor William Moulton Marston, who's played in this movie by Luke Evans, got the idea for Wonder Woman and created a comic strip of his ideas and once his once urban legends started to go around and some of those urban legends turned out to be true and this was around the mid to late 40s the backlash against wonder woman was eminent but not permanent but anyway a little bit more on that later but william moulton marston was a psychologist and he had a polyamorous relationship between his wife who's played in this movie by Rebecca Hall, Elizabeth Marston, and his mistress, who is who was a student at Radcliffe named Olivia Byrne, who's played here in a breakthrough role by Bella Heathcote. And Bella Heathcote is a very unconventionally beautiful actress who has been in such movies previously as Dark Shadows, Fifty Shades Darker, and Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. So she's had a, a vast array of, of interesting movie roles, and this movie certainly adds to them. So Professor Marston, Luke Evans again, is happily married to Elizabeth Marston, played by Re 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 Rebecca Hall, and they're both professors at this Radcliffe College, although because of it being the late 1920s, Elizabeth Marston is struggling to get her PhD because of her credibility in being a woman. So you can see from this movie and from the introduction of Professor Marston, Professor Elizabeth Marston, and their student Olivia Byrne that some things have changed since the 1920s, such as women's rights and also things that were taboo back then but are not so taboo now, and some things haven't. In other words, the relationship that these two professors, these two married professors, and their student Olive have probably would be controversial by today's standards as well. See, that they're a married couple who engage in a bisexual relationship with this student. It gets, it gets Professor Marston fired from his position at Radcliffe, and I think today that would also be very scandalous. Even more scandalous is that Olive eventually moves in with these two and they engage in sexual activity behind closed doors. Is it horrific to watch? No. Is it kinky? Absolutely. Is it controversial? Probably not as controversial as it was in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. But then again, around that time, sex was so taboo that most women who were in college didn't know where babies came from. And that's not an exaggeration either. But then again, the, this, the relationship these, these three have would, yeah, even be 
scandalous by today's standards if, you know, this is, of course, before Playboy and before sex became, of course, before the 60s sexual revolution, before that kind of brought what people did behind closed doors out in the mainstream. But then again, the, the, the origin behind Wonder Woman is probably what makes this movie even stranger and also what makes the story even stranger, not just the movie. And also when you see some of the original panels of the original early forties, wonder woman comics, you begin to wonder how the comic book was even printed to begin with. And you can understand to a certain extent why there was a league of concerned parents who is run? Who is headed by Josette Frank, who might be a composite character, but she's played in this movie by Connie Britton, who's concerned with the sexuality and particularly the images of bondage that exist in these Wonder Woman comic books. But there was also the case of another thing that's changed since the 40s. In the 40s, in fact, before the 1970s, homosexuality and bisexuality were both considered mental illnesses. Now, these were both taken out of the American Psychology Association book of mental illnesses in 1972. So now homosexuality is certainly controversial, but not as controversial, not nearly as controversial as it was back then. So it's interesting to watch this film and see what has changed according to this movie. It's also fascinating to see what Professor Marston and his wife did before the creation of this comic book. Because going into comics is certainly an unlikely career path for somebody who has a PhD and taught college students before. And also from the guy who invented the lie detector test. And his invention of the lie detector test actually served as some motivation behind the creation of Wonder Woman. So this is a movie that is probably not going to, it probably will appeal to people who've seen the Wonder Woman movie from this past summer with Gal Gadot, but it is not recommended for teenage comic book fans, or at least nobody under the age of 15. Maybe not even under the age of 17. But I think that people who grew up reading comic books and maybe people like Kevin Smith who have a little bit more of an open mind would probably get a lot more out of Professor Marston and the Wonder Woman, Wonder Women, than maybe concerned parents. But... There are some weaknesses to this story. For one is the casting of Luke Evans. Luke Evans is a very good looking man, but, and a very young man. He's, he's only 38 years old, but, and he, he stays that way from 1928 to 1945, which is approximately when this movie took place. But if you actually look at real pictures of the real Professor Marston, he actually looks more like Rex Tillerson. So this movie gets my rating of a checkout. I think it tells a very fascinating story. However, the casting of Luke, um, the, the, the actor Luke Evans is probably one of the most questionable. But Rebecca Hall and Bella Heathcote did great jobs with their performances. Steven. Who said that? Me, down here. Ugh, what are you, a yellow booger? I'm a banana slug, Steven. What are you doing in my room? I'm your sense of adventure. It's been a long time since we've had an adventure in the forest. Mom took me to the forest last year. I'm a slug, Steven. It took me a long time to get here. You're right. I should get out. Yeah, the forest is not that far away. Hey, Mom, come to the forest where the more adventurous you lives. Check out discovertheforest.org for cool places nearby. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service and the Ad Council. You want free speech? I got your free speech right here. It's all about free speech, baby. BostonFreeRadio.com Hi, this is Ed Robleski. Tune in every Monday night from 10 to 11 p.m. for Talking Hendrix Retro Rewind, where you can hear some classic shows that we've not aired before here on Boston Free Radio. So tune in every Monday night from 10 to 11 p.m. All this and more on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke, and Words on Film is a show to which you are listening on bostonfreeradio.com, watching on SCAT-V or some community 
access TV station that has been kind enough to pick this show up. To them, I say thank you. Or you are listening and watching me on Facebook Live, either on my own personal page or on Boston Free Radio's Facebook page. Either way, you could join me. I'm glad you could join me to discuss my favorite topic, which is movies. So usually, in fact, over the last couple of months, I've had five movies to review for each show. For this show, I've only been able to watch three new movies. There are a couple of movies that I really wanted to see, but unfortunately I had a very busy weekend and I didn't have time to watch all of them. So instead of going or BSing a review of a movie I didn't see yet, because that would be extremely hard to do if I didn't know the plot and I couldn't tell you how the acting was and I might have to eat my words later, I'm going to get into movie news. And this is kind of a recap of news that's actually going on right now. As this show is being aired right now there's actually been a story that's broken about a han solo spinoff movie that has actually just finished wrapping and apparently phil lord and chris miller are uh directing this film actually no the director of the film is ron howard i don't know who phil lord and chris miller is i i assume that those are actors who are going to be starring in the movie but anyway the title for the movie has been revealed, even though a lot of, they 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 didn't come up with the the title of the movie as it was being filmed. But filming has wrapped. It's a movie that's slated to be released on May twenty fifth, twenty eighteen. The name of the spinoff movie is going to be Solo, a Star Wars story. Yep, that's it. Solo, a Star Wars story. And it might be an interesting film. Again, w- one of the things I was a little worried about with Rogue One from last year and the new Jedi movie, Star Wars Episode Eight from this year, is I am a little bit afraid that Disney is oversaturating the market with Star Wars films. But this movie certainly has looks like it has some promise. The actor who plays Han Solo is an actor named Alden Ehrenrich. And Alden Ehrenrich is a young actor. He's only 28 years old. He's been in such movies as Hail Caesar, where he played this Roy Rogers-type cowboy actor named Hobie Doyle, and he was really good in that movie. He also played Kate Blanchett's son in Woody Allen's Blue Jasmine. He was also in a movie called Beautiful Creatures from 2013, which I actually have not seen, but I hear really good things about that movie. So this is a guy who's been around. He certainly has a distinct look about him. He doesn't look exactly like Harrison Ford, but I think he'll do a good job in this film. The movie also co-stars Emilia Clarke, Paul Bettany, Woody Harrelson, Donald Glover, and a number of other actors, but... It's it's interesting because this is the first movie that Ron Howard has done that's been part of a franchise. I, I don't think that Ron Howard has even started a franchise, if you don't count Cocoon. But then again, there were only two Cocoon movies made. One directed by Ron Howard and the other one that no one has really seen. Or if they've seen it, they don't remember it. So it's interesting that Ron Howard would go to direct a movie that's based on a a previous franchise. But then again, Ron Howard's a really good director other than the movie from the heart of the sea from last year, his uh, directing resume has been pretty solid. So I'd be interested to see how this movie is. And it's good that it has a title now. It, It seems a given that it's about Han Solo. So it would be called Solo, but Again, we'll see how this movie turns out. In another piece of movie news, which is not exactly happy for people who say didn't like the movie Mamma Mia, and I can't say I didn't like it because I actually haven't seen it, but from what I know about the movie and from the online reviews I've seen of it, it's not particularly great. It does have Meryl Streep in it. It also has other great actors like... Colin Firth, Pierce Brosnan, Stellan Sarsgaard, Amanda Seyfried, and others. But, yeah, the movie itself was never really taken seriously. Well, as it turns out, it was taken seriously enough by some to merit a sequel, which is called Here We Go Again. Now, if you can think back to the ABBA song Mamma Mia, and I'm not going to sing it for you because I can't really sing ABBA, but 
it's a given that the sequel would be called Here We Go Again if you know that song particularly well. And it's stuck in your head. I'm sorry. But as it turns out, Meryl Streep, Colin Firth, Amanda Seyfried, and Christine Baranski are returning for this movie with all, all Parker um, writing and directing. But another person has just been added to the cast, none other than Cher. And apparently she hinted at her appearance in this movie uh, over the weekend in a tweet but I guess it's been confirmed by the studio. So this is a movie I'm going to see, but I'm going to be dragged kicking and screaming into it. But it, I don't know what would attract Cher to a movie about ABBA, but I guess that's just movie news for you. Yeah, it's, it's quite surprising as my Facebook followers are texting me right now. What else can I tell you about movie news that's going on right now? Um, actually... Here's a little bit of unfortunate news. There is an actor in Trailer Park Boys named John Dunsworth, who's one of the older members of that TV show, who died, who's just died at the age of 71. And there is no cause to his death, but, or actually ET Canada, Entertainment Tonight Canada, is reporting this. And it says with, Heavy heart, with heavy and broken hearts, the family of John F. Dunsworth would like to let people know that our amazing husband, father, and grandfather, John Dunsworth, has passed away. John left this world peacefully after a short and unexpected illness. The family would like to request that our privacy is respected during this time of grief. So, I'm not particularly familiar with Trailer Park Boys, but... Trailer Park Boys does have a following, and it is unfortunate to hear about John Dunsworth dying at the relatively youngish age of 71. And sounds like the family's keeping his his cause of death private for now, but um, it's it's really unfortunate to hear that kind of news. But it is movie news that I bring to you on Words on Film. You make sure his toys don't have any sharp edges. You taught her what to do when the smoke alarm goes off. You do so much to keep your child safe. But are you using the right car seat for your child? Car crashes are a leading killer of children ages 1 to 13. Protect your child's future at every stage of life. For information on the right seat for your child, visit safercar.gov slash the right seat. A message from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Ad Council. I love those real six sons. Intensify and groove me. All this and more on Earth Hacker Music. Saturdays at noon on Boston Free Radio. Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. And usually at the very end of my show, I get into my segment, What's Coming Out Next? Here I'm going to do a segment similar to that, but it's more like what's coming out on DVD next. Or at least, it's not a very catchy title, but that's what I'm going to go along with. And there are some... Good movies, some interesting direct-to-video or direct-to-streaming films that people might want to check out. And there's one that's come out called The Midwife. It stars Catherine Deneuve. And I remember actually featuring this movie on what's coming out next, but it never came out at a theater near me, so I don't actually know how this movie is. Looks interesting. And if it's nominated for any Oscars in the next couple of months, I might go to see it, but... Uh, then again, uh, again, it's it's out, and if you're interested in seeing it, you could probably catch it on DVD, Blu-ray, or streaming. Another movie that's coming out is one called Landline, which I did catch in theaters a few months ago. This is from the star of and the director of the somewhat controversial comedy Obvious Child, which starred Jenny Slate as a struggling stand-up comic who decides to get an abortion after she finds out she's pregnant. Landline is not as controversial, but I didn't find this movie 
as good when I saw it in theaters. Not as good as Obvious Child. I like Jenny Slate in just about anything she's in, but this movie felt a little too formulaic. It had some originality to it, but I wasn't really taken in by the story. And also, I don't think it made as much use of its mid-90s setting as it could have. Of course, the movie is called Landline, and this was back at a time when cell phones were invented, but only really rich people used them because the 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 bills for cell phones were ridiculously expensive. So most people connected with each other on landline phones. Almost everyone did. I, I remember I certainly did. But the point of the movie is not about how hard it is to connect with people using a landline phone. And yeah, thinking back to the 90s and the early aughts and maybe even before that, but just my memories of those times, it was actually pretty difficult to connect to people via landlines. They would have to be at home for you to call them. And, you know, it, now it seems kind of ridiculous that you would, you would think... The person has to be home for me to contact them. But, yeah, that's the way it was back then. But anyway, Landline is a movie that I thought was good, not great. But if you're interested in seeing it, it is out on DVD and Blu-ray and streaming right now. Another movie that's actually coming to DVD, Blu-ray, and streaming but is not did not come on theaters is another Batman animated movie called Batman vs. Two-Face which I can already tell probably looks maybe a little bit better than the Two-Face segments of Batman Forever, which were, even though I liked Batman Forever, the Two-Face segment was a bit of a disappointment because you didn't really get a good look at how Two-Face became Two-Face, unlike in The Dark Knight, where you got a great uh, origin story of Harvey Dent slash Two-Face. But in Batman versus Two-Face... Former Gothic City District Attorney Harvey Dent, whose face has been scarred by acid, goes on a crime spree based on the flip of a defaced two-headed silver dollar. Among the people who are voice, voice actors in this movie are the recently deceased Adam West, William Shatner, Burt Ward, who played Robin in the original Adam West Batman TV series and who I think is still alive, Julie Newmar, who plays the voice of Catwoman, uh, who also played Catwoman in the original series, and also some voice acting by Stephen Weber, Jim Ward, Thomas Len Lennon, and Lynn Marie Stewart. So this is, a, a, in addition to a number of relatively successful Batman animated movies that have come out direct to DVD or streaming, but I, I actually have to say that I've been pretty impressed with some of the direct to DVD Batman animated films that have come out recently. A lot of people expressed their disappointment of the of the the Joker film, the one where Mark Hamill reprised his role as the Joker. I'm I feel stupid that I can't remember the the name of that movie, but it was pretty dark and it was based on a graphic novel that certainly had a lot of influence on Tim Burton's Batman and also Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy. And I actually thought the the movie was pretty good. I think people were kind of thrown off by the beginning, adding artistic liberty to the fact that Batman was having a relationship, a sexual relationship with Batgirl. I didn't have a particularly big problem with that, but the movie did get better when you found out how the Joker originated and... Also, when it leads up to the final confrontation with Batman, I thought that was extremely well done. But Batman vs. Two-Face is out on DVD and streaming today. So if you want to check it out, there you go. Another movie that's going to be coming out, which was a surprise hit this summer, that's just coming out on DVD, Blu-ray, and streaming, is Girls Trip. This is a movie starring Queen Latifah, Regina Hall, D Jada Pickett-Smith, and a breakout performance by Tiffany Haddish. I think this is a movie that would probably be best, <laughs> probably a girl's night in, I guess. It, it was a movie that actually did surprise me as to how good it was. There were some romantic comedy and cliches that were in it, but I 
love Tiffany Haddish in it. I would love to see her in other movies coming out. And certainly Tiffany Haddish has made more of a name for herself as this movie has gotten released. And I would, I'd love to see her in another film. I think she and Kevin Hart would actually be really funny together in a movie. And I'm just picking out one particular lead actor who would have a good supporting comedian alongside him. So anyway, Girls Trip is out in theaters, or excuse me, it was out in theaters. Now it's out on DVD and Blu-ray and streaming. And you can catch it now and, well, be beginning today. You can tell I'm running out of things to say, but I do have about six seconds left. So just another reminder that you're listening to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio. And I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. <laughs> Hey, everyone, let's all stop what we're doing and take a moment. You see, every moment can be kind of special. But they could be loud moments, goofy moments, dorky moments. It doesn't matter because every time dads like us take a moment like that to spend with our kids, well, it's pretty momentous. So let's take a moment to make a moment. Call 877-4DAD411 or visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. Every Tuesday at 3, something special happens on Boston Free Radio. Why, it's Toppers with your host, Gil. Toppers, spinning the tunes that today's youth demand. From Justin Bieber to Lady Gaga to the Fleetwoods. And, on occasion, Hoagie Carmichael. If you missed the program, you can check out the archives at Toppers Radio. That's one word, dot blogspot, dot C-O-M. Toppers. Welcome back to Words on Film, the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures. I'm your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. And now that I've gotten done my movie news segment and my DVD release segment of the show, now it's time to get into my last segment of the show, which is what's coming out next. These are the big movies that are going to be coming out in theaters near you this coming weekend. The big movie that's coming out this coming weekend is one called Wonderstruck, which is based on a book written by Brian Selznick, who also wrote the invention of Hugo Cabré, which was made into a very auspicious film directed by Martin Scorsese back in 2013 called Hugo, which was an excellent film that was nominated for 11 Oscars. So Wonderstruck has a pretty tough act to follow in Brian Selznick's repertoire, but it's directed by Todd Haynes, who is a director who has brought us such unique movies as Far From Heaven, starring Julianne Moore and Dennis Haysbert, Velvet Goldmine, starring Ewan McGregor, and I'm Not There, which is the Bob Dylan um, <clears throat> biopic, uh, probably one of the most unique biopics I've ever seen about an artist, which starred Christian Bale, Kate Blanchett, Richard Gere, Heath Ledger, and Sam Winshaw, oh, excuse me, Ben Winshaw, amongst other actors. So this might be the first family film that Todd Haynes has ever directed, and it's the story of a young boy in the Midwest that is told simultaneously with a tale about a young girl in New York from 50 years ago as they both seek the same mysterious connection. The movie stars Oakes Fegley, Julianne Moore, the white Michelle Williams, and Millicent Simmons. It's a movie that looks very interesting. It's a movie I will most likely see this weekend, and I'll let you know what I think about it when I do my show next week. Another movie that's coming out is one called The Snowman. And The Snowman might sound kind of innocent, especially given that the holiday season is upon us, but it is actually a crime, drama, horror, mystery thriller that is rated R. It's about a detective named Harry Hole who investigates the disappearance of a woman whose pink scarf is found wrapped around an ominous-looking snowman. So I can't tell... If this is a movie about a snowman that comes to life and kills people, or if it's if the snowman is a MacGuffin. But Michael Fassbender stars in the movie. It also co-stars Rebecca Ferguson, Chloe Sevigny, and Val Kilmer. So based on the premise of the movie and the fact that Michael Fassbender is the star of the film, it might be more than a schlocky horror film. So I will see it for myself, and I will let you know what I think about it next week. Another movie that's coming out is one from 
is is actually a religious movie that has a very stellar cast. So the movie is called Same Kind of Different as Me, and it is released by the probably the penultimate movie studio that releases such films. It's it's a joint release by Paramount Pictures and Pure Flix Entertainment. And Pure Flix Entertainment has been the distributor of a number of films, including the three God's Not Dead films. Yeah, there there have been two that have already been released. There's a third one coming up. What can I say? And they've all they've also released The Case for Christ, which came out earlier this year, and I didn't see that. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, uh, they've also released Hillary's America, which is the the controversial documentary by Dinesh D'Souza. But same kind of different as me is a movie that stars Academy Award winner Renee Zellweger, Academy Award winner John Voight, Academy Award nominee Jamin Hanso, and Academy Award nominee Greg Kinnear. And it's about an international art dealer who must befriend a dangerous homeless man in order to save his struggling marriage to his wife, a woman who dream, whose dreams will lead all three of them on the journey of their lives. So I am very, very curious about this film. Again, a lot of religious films I've seen have been mediocre to just flat out bad. I'm not sure how this movie's going to be. I mean, Renee Zellweger's in it, and she hasn't been in a movie for a really long time. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to re release my opinion about any of the other actors in this film, although I do like some of them. But Same Kind of Different as Me is a movie that I definitely will see this coming weekend, and I will let you know what I think for next week's show. And unfortunately, another Tyler Perry movie is coming out, and unfortunately, this one has Medea. Also, unfortunately, it is a sequel to last year's Boo, A Medea Halloween. It is Boo 2, A Medea Halloween. It's not Boo 2, Another Medea Halloween. That would be a clever title. But Tyler Perry is not exactly clever in the comedy department. This is a movie I will be dragged to kicking and screaming, but I will see it, and I'll let you know what I think for next week's show. But that's all the time we have for Words on Film for this week. Words on Film is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures, and the views and opinions expressed on this show are solely those of yours truly, Dan Burke. They do not necessarily reflect the opinions of any employees of the station airing this broadcast or the station as a whole. But until next week's show, this is Dan Burke saying I'll see you at the movies.